My sermon title today is, Who's Your Daddy? Now, before I start preaching, I want to let those who have struggled with that question let you know that I'm not being insensitive, but I hope that by the time I'm finished preaching, you'll find strength in the Word of God. Who's your daddy? Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, today's your day. These are your words. These are your people. I am your servant. I pray, dear God, that I may be the nail on the wall in which we hang a picture of Jesus for all to see. We ask, dear God, that not I but Christ be honored, loved, and exalted. Father, we need a new view of you today. So as we open your word, as we dust off these Bibles, and as we masticate upon your words, we ask, dear God, that they may find deep root in our hearts, is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is God's plan that we should understand salvation through creation. Often when you read your Bible, you would hear Jesus say words like, the kingdom of heaven is like. And if you were paying close attention, you'd realize that that thing which God is comparing the kingdom of heaven to is something straight out of nature, something that he created. In this instance, the family is one such creation. And on the sixth day, God says in Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the ear, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them. Just now, the Bible used the words image about four or five times, maybe because God wants us to pay attention to something. Man was made in the image of God. Am I correct? And from man, woman was made. Am I correct? And from them both, a child is created. Am I correct? Just as God, the creator of all things and the sustainer thereof, so it is that man ought to be the sustainer of the family, the bearer of the image of God. I'm going to repeat that. God creates man. From man came woman. From man and woman came a child, also known as a family. And as God is the creator and the sustainer of the earth, so is the man to be the sustainer of the family. Not only is he to do that, but he is to be the one who bears the image of God. It was, and still is Satan's plan... To weaken and diminish our trust in God's plan. From the beginning of time, he has been working assiduously to break this plan. Sin was introduced to the world because Satan separated the family unit. The wife was separated from her sustainer, the one who bore the image of God. We can boil all this down to saying this. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who went to find himself a wife. And they both bore children. By taking a wife, he openly expresses his understanding of the husband role he is about to undertake. No explanation is needed. 
he cannot quit midstream his decision to marry, his decision to marry demands that he plays the role. By having children, he openly expresses his understanding of being a father. No explanation needed. He cannot quit his obligation midstream. His decision to procreate demands him living up to the position of father. God intended that this object lesson of the earthly family was to be the perfect reflection of his family. He, God, being the progenitor, the creator, and father of the universe. Much like an earthly father, bearing the title carries expectation. We know how it is. If you're a father, you're expected to do certain things. Those things should not be asked of you. These are things no one has to request, but you're expected to do. Before you plant the corn, you better make sure you have some place to put it when it's reaped. Over time, the family structure has steadily lost its definition. And husbands are no longer the house band. He who should bear the image of God no longer finds interest in maintaining the home treasures by binding his strong, earnest, devoted affection towards the members of his household. The dysfunction of a Christian single parent household strains the child's understanding of the type of father God is to them. If they grow up hearing from the preacher that dad is supposed to be the first image of God that the parents, that a child sees, as we heard today in the child dedication. But the child looks and he, she, he, they see a dad who is callous, a dad who is unfeeling, a dad who is absent-minded, even absent. That action casts doubt on the father in heaven whom this child has never seen. And because they grow up misunderstanding the father role of their earthly father, they grow up misunderstanding the role of their heavenly father. So when they pray, they pray amiss and they don't get what they desire because they don't know the role of their fathers. Speaking of asking, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. This thing called family is a very important situation. And yes, I am very cognizant that it's prayer day, not family life. But if you believe that the two are separate entities, you are mistaken. Because we believe that just because we have breath in our lungs and thoughts in our minds, we can conjure up enough good enough thoughts to present to the Almighty God. We are mistaken. God tells you how to come to God. Luke chapter 11 is the chapter that famously housed the Lord's Prayer. We know it. But we're not going to focus on the Lord's Prayer today. I'm going to borrow one sentence from it. But what I want to look at mostly is the situation surrounding the Lord's Prayer. Please don't sleep on me today. As a matter of fact, sleep if you want to sleep. Every tub I have to sit on their own bottom. And somebody's going to leave here stronger and somebody isn't. Amen. Luke 11 verse 1 says this. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. 
as John also taught his disciples. Now I'm about to mess my sermon up. Now if I'm walking with Jesus, if I'm walking with Jesus and I saw all the things that Jesus did, if I had an opportunity to ask Jesus for something, I'm not going to ask him to teach me to pray. I'll speak the realness for you. There are things in my life that I believe that I need, and as a result, I am going to ask God to fill those voids for me, so I'm going to ask him for those things which I think I need. But the fact that these earthly men did not ask for those things, they asked Jesus to teach them to pray, it means that something happened before verse 11. You could read it in Luke 9, but I want to read it from Mark. Let's go to Mark chapter 9. Are you with me? Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 takes you to what's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And the gospel tells us in Mark chapter 9 that Jesus had a custom. He grabbed Peter. He grabbed James, and he grabbed John, and they went up the mountain. That means that there were nine other disciples left at the bottom of the mountain. Is my math off? No, good. And while they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus didn't want company. Jesus invited them to go and pray with him. But the Bible tells us that as Jesus prayed, they fell asleep. And while they fell asleep, something appeared. Moses and Elijah came out of nowhere. And one of them woke up and they wrote in the record that once they woke up, they saw that this, this encounter changed the countenance of Jesus. His clothes that he once had on became radiant. His skin became radiant. There was something different about this Jesus. And after that encounter took place, those two men left. And as they came down the mountain to, to rejoin the church, a man met them on the way. And the man said, Jesus, I need your help. I went down to Mamre to get some help for my son. He is possessed of a devil and Mamre couldn't help me. The nine deacons, the nine elders that you left behind, the men who have been following after you so long that they should have gotten a little bit of power, they didn't have enough to help me. So Jesus, I need your help. So Jesus said, bring the boy to me. And after he, they, the man brought the boy to him, still foaming at the mouth, still, 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 still being possessed by the devil, Jesus cast out the devil. And after Jesus cast out the devil, he left that situation. And in verse 28 of Mark chapter 9, the Bible says, And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? Why didn't they ask Jesus privately, publicly rather, why didn't they ask him at the point of failure, why is it that you were able to do this now and I couldn't do it and I've been here for a few hours? And Jesus said to them, in verse 29, This kind can come forth by nothing, but by what? Now how many times have you read that text? And we love to quote that sometimes when somebody calls us and they say, well, sister, you got to pray, you got to fast. When we know that in ourselves, there has never been a time when we were faced with such an arduous task that we would not even go to work because we have to stay home and fast. How many times have you stayed up all night and say, listen, I don't even want to pray. I don't even want to eat because my child is wayward and those things are a luxury to me right now. Their salvation is what's important. Jesus says, you got to fast and you got to pray. But I want to share some principles with you. And the first principle is this. 
a moment of victory requires hours of preparation. A moment of victory requires hours of preparation. Much like many things in our lives, minutes of execution requires hours, days, even weeks of preparation. For example, for those of you who are going and have gone to school, that exam that is for about 45 minutes, you have spent weeks and months to prepare for that 45 minutes. There are things that you are going to do on presentation that you have to make, and you labor hour after hour preparing for five minutes. And in this situation, Jesus is saying, in order for you to speak the word and have demons flee in a moment, it takes hours of preparation. And many of us want things, but we don't want to put in the work. Moments of victory requires hours of preparation. If we expect to stand apart in life and in, things we, in the things we do, we must spend time in pre preparation for the moment and even the unexpected moments. Jesus understood that in order to receive power to help mankind, he had to make time to connect with the Father. Now, Jesus' action in Luke, in Luke chapter 9 and Mark chapter 9 sheds much light on Luke chapter 11. And let's read it again for emphasis. And it came to pass that as he was praying again in a certain place, he ceased. One of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. This disciple asked Jesus to teach them to pray. This shows spiritual maturity. Prior to this, Jesus Prior to this, rather, James and John wanted to sit on the right hand and on the left hand of Christ, but now they're not seeking notoriety. They want to know how to effectively connect with the source of power because just now they failed. How often have you failed in life and we just chalk it up to that moment? We don't go back. We don't recalibrate. We don't recalculate. We just said, well, it is what it is. And we just keep on trucking. But these disciples say, no, 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 no. This is the last time a situation is going to come when I know the power of God is available to me and I fail. Teach me to pray. And Jesus, he didn't even hitch. In verse 2, he said, Guys, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, which means that everybody at some point in their life, you're going to pray. He said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. That's all I want from that. Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus, in that moment, teaches us to call his father our father. In a world where most children don't even have fathers, and there are many fathers present, but they're absent. Jesus is inviting us to call his father our father, which means that if I call God dad, Jesus is my brother, and whatever Jesus has is available to me. Amen. Jesus 
teaches us to call his father our father. He is not ashamed to call us brethren. So readily, so eager is the Savior's heart to welcome us as members of the family of God that in the very first words we are, used, we are to use in approaching God, he places the assurance of our divine relationship with our Father. You see, many times we, 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 we pray and we have the, these, the, these platitudinous names for God and we don't even understand that what we call God is what we anchor our prayer in and we don't even answer, understand our own words. God of heaven, of the celestial stars and skies and earth. Listen, stop. God is saying, call me Father. Because every person, whether you have a dad or not, if you have one, you know what a dad is supposed to be. If you don't know, you know what you want your dad to be. Call me daddy. And many of us, we forget our role as a child and then we forget our role as a parent and we miss lessons like this. But little do we know that we have this text already built into our hearts. I'm going to show you why or how. When a child comes to a parent and they want to ask for something, what is the first words out of their mouth after they looked you in the eye? Amen. Mom, Dad, and after that child says that, you cannot say no, I heard. You cannot say no, because that child is giving you a title that says, listen, if there is anybody in this world I should ask for anything, it's you, because as far as I know, you are capable of everything, so mama or daddy. The Bible says, our father. And everything that God is doing in heaven stops because his child now needs him. What parent would hear a child say mommy and daddy and brushes that child aside? That parent does not know God. This leads me to principle number two. When we call on our Father, who is God, we ought to recognize that our dad is sovereign. It's a fancy word, but it means this simply. The word sovereign means unmatched in power and authority. He is independent in power and authority. As some preachers like to say, he is God all by himself. He requires no co-signing. But preacher, I still don't get it. Now, now, now think about this. There are nations in this world who are sovereign and those who are not sovereign. For example, America is a sovereign country, which means that when America decides to do something, America does not have to ask permission of England because America already got their independence from England. They are sovereign, and God is standalone. So when God decides to move, God doesn't have to say, hold on one second, let me check in with somebody. God has to check in with nobody. When God speaks and God moves, he moves independently. But what does it mean to be sovereign? Number one, God is before all. Colossians 1.17 tells us, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. 
Psalm 90, 90 verse 2 tells us, Before the mountains were brought forth, or even thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. No, 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 I'm trying to paint a picture of who your daddy is. The Bible says he is before all, but I got some more Bible text. God produces all. Colossians 1.16 tells us, For by him were all things created that are in the heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. God produces all. God, number three, transcends all. Psalm 97 verse 9 tells us, For thou, Lord, art high above the earth, thou art exalted above all gods. Now let's stick a pin right here. I'm not done yet with exalting our God. But if we know that God transcends all, why is it that when your back is against the wall, he is the last person you call? Now that tells me, that whoever you call, whether it be your mommy, your daddy, even the pastor, you are telling them that you are above God and God is just going to kick back and watch for you to wake up, fail and come and call on him. There is not one child out there who would be in trouble and know that their parents is available and run to their neighbor. No child. There is no child you would ever hear arguing on the playground saying, your daddy is better than my daddy. No, 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 no. It's always, my daddy is better than your daddy. So if we know that our daddy is bigger, and if we know that our daddy is better, why is it when we come to our father, we come with such timidity? God knows all. Psalm 147 verse 5 tells us, God is our Lord. And of great power, there is no limit to his understanding. Hebrews chapter 4 13 tells us, there is no creation hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of whom we have to account. God can do all things. Jeremiah 32, 27 tells us, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? You see, but that's the problem I have with your answers. You're going to rightly respond nothing, but again, you're going to run to your neighbor. God owns all. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and everything that's in it. Who you're going to call that can give you something that they created on their own, they're going to take from God to give to you. Why not just cut out the middleman? God rules over all. Psalm 20, 29 verse 10, the Bible tells us that the Lord sitteth upon the flood, yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. And because our God, our Father is, suffer is suffering, Psalm 135, 6 tells us that whatever the Lord pleases, he does. He ain't got an answer to nobody. Whatever God pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in the deep places, places that you can't even go. And you're going to call somebody who can't even afford a metro card. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord works out everything to its proper end. Even the wicked for the day of disaster. Now, now you see why I love this one? <laughs> You see, there's going to be some people who are going to do you some things, but you have to trust the plan of God because sometimes when I call Ella Rollins for some comfort, Ella Rollins goes, listen, man, just cuss him out. Don't even need, run with that. 
and he is going to give me a bad advice. But God might say, listen, my son, ride out your storm, ride out your storm, because whatever I plan, it has a proper end. And even those who offend you, they're going to have their day. You don't get to choose that. Job 42, 2, Job said this, I know that thou canst do everything, God, and that no thought can be withheld from you. That's what being sovereign means. Now, after I've described that, I dare you. I dare you to name one man who lived or who is living who compares to this description. That's what sovereign means. Having the ultimate source of power. The ultimate source of authority. And that everything exists in him. Only our father can make those claims. Therefore, it's God's sovereignty that makes him superior to the person who you think can fix your needs. There's absolutely nothing that happens in this universe that is outside the influence of God. Nothing. Now, that's a hard thing to swallow because sometimes we go through some hard situations, Sister Joy, like, like losing both our parents in a short span of time. You have to trust the word of God. If you're going to pray it, if you're going to preach it, you're going to have to trust it. And in that time, you are going to understand sometimes God can't tell you everything you want to know now. You have to trust him. Sometimes words fail us as leaders to comfort the saints, but trust God. He knows what you're going through. You remember he had a son who died? God's heart melted. He knows how you feel. Trust God. But there's one problem. As much as God is supreme, and as much as God is sovereign, there's one problem, Elder. God has one limitation. Now, before you stone me, remember, I die easily. Before you stone me, or before you pull me aside and give me an exegetical theological disposition of why I'm wrong, just bear with me. Just bear with me, preacher. God has one limitation. And that's principle number three. God is bound by his word. God is bound by his word. That's the limit of God. If he says it, he got to do it. And Numbers 3 verse 19 tells us, God is not a man. Now he's saying to you, go grab your daddy. Put him on this side and put me over here. And he's saying to you, I am not like him. That I should lie. Now I'm not calling your daddy's liars. But if he said he was going to do something, and he didn't do it, even though he didn't intend to lie to you, by the spirit of the law, he's a liar. And the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Which means that if he says something and you don't think you got it, he don't have to apologize to you or push the date out because it didn't happen yet. He don't have to repent. Repent means that you have to take back what you did or what you said. God don't take back nothing. Amen. Which means that God's plans are perfect. Amen. Then the question is asked, Hath he said, and that shall he not do? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Did not God make a promise and he did it? Yes. If God is saying I'm the same yesterday, today, and, and forever, 
The problem is we're okay with the yesterday because the Bible shows us the evidence of the yesterday, but we're struggling with the today. And let me tell you something, the tomorrow is going to be much more difficult than today. So if you're not grasping the today, I don't know how you're going to make it tomorrow. There are instances in the Bible when God showed his power. God allowed the sun to stand still in the sky. Now somebody explain that to me. You can't. God allowed a man to put a rod in the sea and it opened. He allowed another man to step in the water. You know how much time I step in the beach and it didn't part? No matter how much I jumped, let me tell you something. Even Job says, who is that man who commanded the waters to go so far and no more? If God wants something to move or not move, all he has to do is command it and it obeys. So if your daddy... Is better than your daddy. Why is it that your prayers aren't being answered? Is it that you have not mastered the art of melting your father's heart? Why is it that you pray? Because the Bible says when you pray, which means you have. Why is it that you have not gotten what you asked for. The Bible teaches that when you pray, you need to rest your assurance in the one who you are praying to. Now think about it. If I was rich, if I was rich, I just want to make that abundantly clear. And you got into a financial bind. Logically, it would make sense to ask the individual who has an excess in what you're lacking. Logic. Common sense. And that is what we often do. And God is saying, all that you need, I can supply because I will take care of you. You ought to rest your assurance that he has in excess what you are lacking in to a point where he said, I got so much, I have to keep the windows of heaven closed because God forbid, excuse me, if I forbid, I open up the windows of heaven, you have no room to receive it. So I have to push it and catch it so you don't get overwhelmed. But the problem is, you ask a miss, so you get zero. Same example. If I am poor, which I am, and you got into financial straits, and you come to me and say, Elder, help. I would say to you, listen, wherever you got help from, you let me know. Because it does not make sense. And God is saying to you, when you know somebody can do something, young man, you can go to them confidently. Because evidence is there so you can rest your assurance on the fact that they have this or they have that. That if you ask, they are able to give you what you ask for. But many times we ask, and because we don't know the fullness of God, we enter into God's presence 
with an unsurety. And God is saying, hold up. Unsurety is a derivative of doubt. And what you are telling me to my face is that, Lord, I'm asking you, but I don't believe you could do it. But I'm just doing it out of formality. And God is disrespected. When you pray, rest your assurance in your Father who is sovereign. Your Father who promises and keeps his word. How many times your dad says something to you and never kept his word? Mm -mm, God is not like that. New dad, God is not like that. He isn't like the earthly father who have let you down. He will move heaven and earth to the fulfillment of his promise. The problem is we have been asking for things that God has not promised. Remember, principle three. He's bound by his So if he said it, all you have to do is regurgitate it, and he has to do it. Now you're looking at me like, whoa. That's a little bit straightforward to be talking about the God of heaven and earth. He says, prove me. And the reason why you have not is because you ask not. You see, somebody says on earth, there's a, there's, a, there's a colloquial term that says, closed mouths don't get fed. And we are spiritually and everything famished because we refuse to take God at his word. If you would open God's word, you would see what God says. And if you want to know what God said... All you have to do is to take that leather-bound thing in your lap and read it. And all you have to say is, God, you said. If you should open his word, you will see promises. Promises like Exodus chapter 14 verse 14 when he says to you, I will fight for you. Hold your peace. God has promised that your days will be long upon the land if you honor your mother and father. That's the commandments. God says that he, God promised to give power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. That's Isaiah. The Lord promised that I, the Lord thy God, will hold thee by thy right hand, saying to thee, fear not, I will help thee. You see, sometimes God knows that just speaking the promise to you is not enough. Sometimes he has to come and hold up your hand. He needs you to remember that there's somebody in your corner. So you don't even doubt. He said, I'm going to speak to you and I'm going to comfort you. He said, relax. Isaiah 43, 2 says, when thou passest, through the waters. I'm happy for this. Because a brother can't swim. He says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shall not be burned. Neither shall a flame kindle upon thee. You see, you see we like to talk about the three boys. They're like, God was good. But if something should happen and our situation overtakes us to a point where we feel so overwhelmed, we forgot about them that the same God then is the same God now. And he says, listen, I will be with thee. The same Isaiah tells us in chapter 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue Everybody that set their face to talk about God's apple. Anybody who set their lips to disrespect God's child, the Bible says you will condemn them in the judgment. But you don't know that because you don't read your Bible. You see, when you pray, you got to pray with authority because you're not speaking your own words. You're quoting your daddy. That's why the Trump boys can be so arrogant. Because they know who their daddy is. 
Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, God promises. James 1.5 says, listen, if you find yourself lacking wisdom, ask. Just ask, and I will give you what you need. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful, and he's just to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. The Bible says in Psalm 46 verse 1, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. And as God's people trying to live right in a sinful world, we find ourselves in trouble more often than not. But didn't God tell you in Malachi 3.10, to prove him now? He did, right? Yeah, remember. Didn't God tell you in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6 that you should call upon him? Didn't he say that? Yes, he did. And when you call, when you call, you say, you said, Father, so I will do. When you call, say, Father, you said, come, so I'm here. You said, Father, you said, relax, so I'm standing still. Father, you said, cry unto you, so I'm here pleading my case. Father, you said, confess, so I'm laying my sins bare before you, God. Father, you said, trust in me. I won't seek another solution. Father, you said remember, so I'm following through. Father, you said love those who despitefully use you. Lord, I'm trying. You said I can do all things through Christ. Father, I believe. And after you have quoted your father to your father, and after he has moved heaven and earth for you, you can turn to someone who's doubting. Someone whose confidence is not up on the promises of God or who their father is. And you can say to them, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petition that we desire of him. Why? Because he told me what to do and I did it. My father has proved himself time and time and time again. So I have confidence in anything he says. All we have to do is ask, believe, and claim. God is tired of these foolish prayers that we're praying. When you get invited to go somewhere, you look at the flyer so you can know how to dress. Is it formal? Can I wear my sneaks? Can I put on some jeans? How am I to dress? And you conform to the protocol required for the event. Why is it that you think prayer and communication with God is a hopscotch situation? You jump in how you feel, you jump out how you feel. No, no, no. God's saying, do not waste my time. If you ask, I will move. I stand poised at your service. But if you ask something that I never said, I am not bound by it. And God wants to save somebody today. Not only did he do it, he put his money or his son where his mouth is. He said, listen, not only did I come to seek and to save that which was lost, as a matter of fact, I'm going to send my son and what you are lacking in, he has that in abundance. You need life. He has it. But in order for you to get it, he has to die. 
and his son died so you will have eternal life. And God, who has freely given his son, watches us every day pray about the same sin which we have no intent of giving up. And every time his son stands willing to pour out his soul to his father for you, when you have no intent of living right. And every day, dad has to watch one child allowing the other child to bleed afresh. But one day, dad is going to say, enough, enough. There is only so much one parent can give. I have given you everything. I have given you opportunities. I've given you time. I have given you chance. If I gave you a thousand more, it wouldn't make a difference because your heart is not set on owning the name of godliness and holiness. But today, I believe that someone here wants to bear that name. I believe today somebody wants to begin to pray differently. I believe that somebody is going to go home. Somebody is going to open their Bible. Somebody is going to take God at his word. The song said, "Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. He's only bound by his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know thus, thus, thus. Thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him, or and or and, and you see, God has proven himself even when your faith was weak with the hope that you'd recognize it and gain some strength, but you believe that you're entitled, and God is saying, No, 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 today you're gonna ask for it, and you're gonna ask correctly because I'm willing to give I'm willing to give the Bible says we should be the head and not the tail one of the things that pains my heart is when we believe as black folk in America that we're subjugated to being menial and choosing and taking what is left of everybody else God says no 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 mm -mm. God says top shelf for you but guess what if you don't believe that top shelf is yours you won't pray for top shelf you will say lord I, I, i'm just grateful that i got something god says what what do you mean by you want crumbs i got the whole loaf on the table for you i got a seat at the table for you and you want to eat what the dogs eat when your father is telling you that this feast this spread is yours but you're comfortable you're comfortable with second servants we have not because we ask not because we don't know the power of God you're gonna pray for a car show me in the word you want to pray for a husband show me in the word it ain't there God wants you and once God got you and put you in his bosom you're going to be surprised that somebody else is there desiring the same thing and if you're smart enough you would realize that God just worked for you but you got to ask the right questions and you don't have to rack your brain to find out what are these questions just regurgitate it just repeat his words to him and as you go through and you take a text, as C.D. Brooks used to say his mom used to do, as she get to a text, she would put tea beside it, test it. And she would, she, would, she would present this scripture before God. And when God came through, she would go back and put a tea, a pee beside it, proven. Can we say that? God wants us to test them. The question is, Who's your daddy? Because Satan wants you to look everywhere but to the sanctuary. Who's your daddy? God is your father. 
and he's willing to do everything for you. Today, if you want your father to do a different thing in your life, today, I invite you to stand. is a song for somebody who have tested and somebody who have proven. So I, I want to apologize for imposing a song on you that you're not yet ready to sing. But I want to speak in faith knowing that the next time we sing this song as a community, as a family, that you will sing with the assurance that you have proven God. And the pitiful words we call songs coming out of our mouths would be resounding through this place because we have had an experience when people who have experience speak you can know they don't have to give you their curriculum vitae they can speak and the knowledge that comes from their mouth from their heart tells you that they have a foundation but this song should be the anthem of our hearts we want to prove God. We want to test God because he gave you permission to do it. But the fact of the matter is, for so long, we have succumbed to Satan's deceit. And we treat the God of heaven as we treat the Father on earth. If that's the case, you get nothing. You get nothing. This afternoon, I want to invite somebody forward. Somebody who's struggling with something. Somebody who wants to lay it at the altar. As Marcus said, this is what the altar is for. If you're struggling, come. Let me find my place. If you're struggling, come. Because you know what, beloved? It's pointless to take home what you brought here. If this was the Old Testament days and that was your mindset you wouldn't even make it to the door of the camp according to Exodus chapter 14 verse 12 you would have been dead already because God cannot allow anybody who is not in tune with his plan at that moment to bring discord into the camp and right now God is at a place where he's trying to purify his church so if you are not of a mindset to get your mind right then God is doing something the Bible calls it God's strange act anybody ever heard about that that's when God moves against you because you're not moving when he's telling you to move because you want to hold somebody and people in your heart and you think that you have a right who are you God is now working and he's saying come 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 pray for those who despitefully use you no matter who they are bring them to the altar I will sort them out trust me I've seen God deal with people I've given my testimony from work I've seen how God have made bosses my footstool but yeah you say amen say amen for your own situation and you can't because God wants you to have an experience but we don't because we have not tested him and we have not proven him and God is like a player on the bench he's warmed he's ready to go in but nobody wants to let him in the game and we're losing today we want to do something different we want our prayers to be different we want our calls to God to be different and once those things are different, you're going to see how things in your life, they're going to change. If you simply do it God's way. You're going to realize that you won't have to work so hard for things that you think you need. Eventually, you're going to realize that the objectives you have in your life, that's not even God's plans for you. Because God sees the end from the beginning. 
We're going to give one more person a chance to come. We're going to pray. Regardless of how you feel about me, I'm insignificant at this moment. Don't let me stop you. Don't let anybody up here stop you. Because let me tell you something. What you don't know is that this could be your very last call. Right now, somebody could be pushing against the Holy Spirit and this is your last opportunity at salvation. Come. Come. All heads are bowed. All eyes are closed. Dad, your son is here. Your children are here. We're at your feet now, Lord. Father, we have done evil in your sight. We have seen the extent and the lengths that you have gone through to keep us safe. But on a daily basis, Dad, we have chosen to do wrong. We have broken your heart time and time and time and time again. And right now, Father, we're asking you if you could find it in your heart to forgive us. We ask that you will. Lord, we come with our burdens. Father, some of us, we're struggling with issues that we have not imposed upon ourselves. Life situation have made us the way that we are. Some, Lord, are self-imposed. Some of us, Lord, we have manufactured our own problems. But regardless of what they are, there is nothing impossible for you that have seen you work in the lives of others and they're not better than anyone here today. So we're asking you, Lord, to move in the life of every individual, in the life of every family here, Lord. You see that family that's on the brink of the solution, Lord. We're asking you to, to, to intervene, God. That that husband would remember his role that the wife will remember her role and as they, they move in the blueprint that you have set up dear God I pray that you may reform the foundations that have been broken to the child that is wayward to the parent who have lost sleep to the parent who comes to church and just desires for their children to be here much more to have a relationship with you we present them before you dear God because there are many mothers here putting on a strong face for the work but Lord you know that their hearts are broken children have walked away and their hearts are broken Lord their husbands who just want to, 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 to live any kind of life, Lord, and wives and families are suffering. God, I ask you to intervene on the authority of your word. You said, Lord, you said male and female, Lord, bind the family together. You said we should ask, so we're not even asking, Lord. We're begging Jesus. We shouldn't even have to because you're our father. But things are so desperate, Lord, that we really have to call it as it is. Even in this house, Lord, there's cliques, there's separation, there's disunity. This place, Lord, which ought to be the pillar and the ground of your truth, I pray, Lord, that you may bring unity and truth into this house. That as we as a family, we stand on the principles of your word, regardless of what another might say, we know that we ought to obey God rather than man. To the one who right now, who's given their hearts to Jesus, take their life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I pray, dear Lord, that they will leave here 
with Jesus in their hearts, with a song in their minds, that as they walk the streets of Brooklyn, they will be seen as somebody who's emanating the love of their dad. And they, Lord, who are, who are searching and who are looking can come to this place and find out that God is still adopting. Amen. So even now, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. Hear our prayers, dear Lord. Hear our prayers. Seal our desires today. Let our motives, let our prayer let our actions change into your will. Thank you for hearing us. And thank you for answering. Is our prayer in the name of your holy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. And amen.